Welcome everyone to our spring version of the NIST Merck Meetup. Uh, today's topic I, th I think is a very interesting one, which is open source software in the pharmaceutical industry. And we have three really excellent speakers. So I wanna kind of work through the introduction and, and get right to them because they have a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, first, just to remind you some ground rules and, and where we are, we're using Zoom software, which everybody's pretty familiar with these days. Uh, all your audio lines are on mute so we can keep the background noise to a minimum. Uh, but we really do encourage questions. The whole idea of a meetup is to have some discussion. So uh, we would like you to use the Q&A uh, panel uh, for that. And you can usually find that by hovering down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or there's a couple other ways to do it for those of you who are a little more facile with it. Uh, and uh, we may try to address some of them as we go actually in the Q&A function, but, but pretty much we're gonna hold questions to the end so that we can make sure that all the speakers get their due time and then we'll sort of collect the questions together and, and some of them probably will be uh, appropriate for more than one speaker. But uh, if, if you do know what speaker you wanna address it to, that's always helpful. And then we do encourage use of the chat feature to talk amongst yourselves or if you need to talk uh, with the technical people who are helping out with the Zoom session. Uh, the chat feature is it's good for that. Uh, to remind you, this is sponsored by NIST, which is the National Institute of Statistical Sciences. Uh, it's a nonprofit uh, National Research Institute for Statistics. Uh, they have, uh, well, their mission is to promote statistical research, and they do through that, that through postdocs, conferences, workshops, independent research, and the affiliates program, which is really where this uh, NIST, Merck, NIST Merck meetup uh, comes from. Uh, and that's really uh, companies like Merck and like some others that get together and, and realize that they have common interest in statistical issues and, and, and allowing NIST to help them uh, achieve some of those uh, research uh, goals. Uh, if you're interested in what NIS has available, and it, it really is an ever-increasing uh, list of, uh, of, of activities, uh, go to the NIS work uh, website, www.nis.org. And if you look under activities, you'll see ones like the two I'm gonna mention, uh, like this online seminar on mathematical foundations of data science. And that's coming up at the end of this month, April 30th. And uh, one of the signature NIS events uh, is the Ingram Oakham Forum Series. Uh, there's uh, one of those on unplanned clinical trial disruptions uh, that's coming up again uh, it, towards the end of April. And you can see some pretty prominent speakers there. So uh, I encourage you to go to the NIST events uh, part of the NIST website and see what's going on with this. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, today we're gonna to talk about open source software and pharma. But I'll remind you that this, like all of our NIST Merck meetups will be recorded and the slides will be posted at the NIST website that I was just talking about. And if you go there, you'll find recordings and, and, and slide sets for the other uh, Merck NIST or NIST Merck uh, meetups we've had. And you can see some of them listed there. So lots of topics that uh, are important for the farm industry. As I mentioned, uh, we have three great speakers, uh, Andy Nichols uh, from the R Validation Hub and TSK is gonna talk about why it's so difficult to use open source languages uh, for GXP analyses. A and then we're really thankful to have uh, Paul Schuett uh, from, from FDA to give sort of a regulator's perspective on, on open source software and, uh, and, and how that works and some of his ideas of what regulators think about. Uh, and then we have uh, Ted uh, Listig and uh, Tarek uh, Haddad uh, from Medtronic uh, to tell us a little bit about their experience uh, with the device industry and actually doing submissions uh, in uh, using open source uh, languages. Uh, so I think uh, the device world's probably a little ahead of the pharmaceutical world here. So with that, uh, let me stop uh, sharing my slides and I'll let uh, Andy start to share his slides. And while he's doing that, uh, let me introduce him. So 
Uh, we're very lucky to have Andy Nichols, who uh, is the head of statistical data sciences at GSK. Uh, he's been a user and strong advocate for the use of R over 15 years. As part of a data science capability development objective, he's responsible for driving R adoption initiative with the GSK Biostatistics Group. Uh, his team has helped create bi biostatistics uh, dedicated uh, analytics platform for R and developed a worldwide R training program. Uh, the team has uh, led the development of several R-based tools and applications to assist the rollout and adoption of R in clinical and non-clinical applications. And within the wider pharmaceutical industry, he's the lead for the R Validation Hub, uh, which is a collaboration to support adoption of R within the pharmaceutical uh, regulatory setting. Uh, he's trained as a mathematician and a statistician with degrees from the University of Bath and from the University of Southampton. Uh, and then since uh, rejoining GSK in 2017, he's become the head of data science consultancy, or excuse me, prior to rejoining GSK in 2017, uh, he was the head of data science consultancy at Mango Solutions. Uh, so with that, Andy, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I assume you can, can you give me a quick thumbs up that you can hear me yep. well and see my slides? Great. Um, so thank you for the um, for the introduction. Also, I need uh, to thank Dan for helping me uh, confirm my title for this talk. Um, as the lead for the R Validation Hub, I, um, I often find myself giving uh, talks around uh, the use of R in the GXP space. I'm never really sure what to call this talk and this this title, um, I think, was a throwaway suggestion by me um, based on uh, 10 or 15 years of frustration of trying to use R and, uh, and other open source tools um, within, uh, within our industry. And, uh, uh, and we, we settled on it. And, and hopefully, um, uh, hopefully uh, the talk will deliver to your, uh, to your expectations. So um, in that role as uh, as the R Validation Hub lead, there are uh, a number of different things that people approach me about. And quite often, the question I get asked most of the time is, how do I validate R? Um, I guess we have ourselves to blame for that, calling it the R Validation Hub. Um, although if you, uh, and if you Google the, how do I validate R, you will find the R Validation Hub very, very quickly. So it is kind of by design that we call ourselves that. Um, and we did so because we knew that that's the kind of question that people are asking. Um, however, I do think it's kind of, um, it's the wrong question really to be asking in this space. So it, it's a very common question, but we don't tend to validate programming languages. We don't validate our closed source and we don't validate our open source languages. So. Um, if you want to get into the nuances of it, you can talk about qualification of languages and so on. Um, but in the context that we interpret validation, uh, we tend to talk about validating systems and the regulations that apply in this space tend to talk about um, uh, tend to talk about the validation of systems where, of which programming languages may be a part. Um, but it's very uh, it's not really appropriate to talk about the validation of languages themselves. So what is an appropriate question? Um, I think. Uh, this is perhaps a bit more uh, a bit more relevant, which is, is my software reliable? Um, and that's really what we're trying to ask um, when, we're, when we're using a programming language. How can I uh, ensure it's reliable? And the reason I use the word reliable is uh, this is exactly what um, the ICH guidelines use when they talk about software. So I've highlighted a couple of bits from, from the guidelines. So this is ICH E9. Uh, and there's a very small section on uh, integrity of data and computer software validity. And in that, it does mention uh, it does mention validity, um, but it talks about validity of methods, which I would interpret more as the, um, whether you're using the right method for your, your data, for example. So if you have uh, survival data, are you using something like a Cox proportional hazards model? If you have longitudinal data um, that's normally distributed, are you using mixed models, are you using LACF? using the right methods for the type of data that you have. Um, and in that sense, we're talking about validity. With respect to the software that's used, this bottom bit that I've highlighted, um, it, ICHE 9 says the computer software used for data management and statistical analysis should be reliable. So hence, hence my preference of the word reliable and documentation of appropriate software testing procedures should be available. It does not say you should validate the software. And, and indeed, um, something that's always popular in talks in this space 
Um, and something I always include is the statistical software clarifying statement from the FDA, which was released in uh, 2015. Uh, this actually quotes at the bottom, uh, quotes the ICH uh, E9 guidelines. Uh, and the FDA also clarified that in their, uh, what's known as 21 CFR part 11, um, which talks about um, uh, the use of uh, electronic records and electronic signatures uh, within the industry and, and the regulations that apply there, um, they are clear that um, Cisco software is not explicitly discussed in that. And, and, uh, and all they say is that your analysis should be fully documented, including version and build identification. So it makes sense the reproducibility, traceability reasons that you should um, be able to say, this is the software I use and this is the version of it. Um, but as far as any kind of validation um, goes, all they do is again quote uh, ICHE9, uh, that, that same piece about being reliable and that we should use appropriate software testing procedures. So what does that really mean in practice? Um, here's an example from uh, what I would call a popular closed source uh, programming language. Uh, it's a language that I do know how to write code in, but it's um, those who know me will know that it's not something I code in every day. Um, and you've probably already de detected my bias um, uh, toward, towards R. Uh, so uh, apologies to any SAS users who are looking at this and thinking this is a, a terrible looking uh, script. That's that's my limited knowledge. The point is that what I'm trying to do here is create a very simple data set which contains the numbers one to five. And then I'm going to calculate some summary statistics using uh, using proc means. And when I run that code, I'm going to get I get some results that look like this. So from the numbers not one to five, there are five numbers. I can see the minimum is one, the maximum is five. That's all fine. I know that the mean of those numbers is three. So SAS has given me the, the answers I expect. The one that's perhaps a bit harder to verify is the standard deviation. So the standard deviation 1.58, that's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty difficult calculation to do in my head, but um, it is possible to verify that. And uh, at least when I look at that, it's in the realms of what I would expect. It seems to be uh, the plausible plausible standard deviation for this uh, for this data. So if we ask ourselves is, um, the question, is this reliable? Well, in four of the five um, cases of output there, we know that that is correct. We can uh, we know what the expected answer is, and we can say that's correct. And in the case of the standard deviation, we've got a reasonable idea that it's in the right ballpark at least. But that's not the only thing that goes into um, uh, the statement of, about reliability. It's we're not just factoring in this particular example. I know the case because if you make make a more complicated example um, using a larger data set, we're not necessarily going to know the actual answer. We will still have some intuition. We'll still know if it's in the right ballpark, but we're not going to know um, the answer. So other things feed into our reliability as well. Um, and those start with kind of historical. Um, expectations. I've used the software before and it did what I expected. So I've been uh, using SAS on and off for uh, around 15 years. And when I've calculated summary statistics using proc means for other data, again, in those cases, it's done what I expected. So I've built up a, a level of trust, if you like, over time. And that, that contributes to the reliability. After, after all, reliability is something that um, you, you demonstrate time and again. It's not a, a, a one-off statement. Similarly, many others around me are using the software. Um, so it's no surprise, you know, SAS is the most popular um, language within this industry, certainly for regulatory submissions. Um, many, and, and that count that adds some value. Many others are using the software. It does what they expect as well. Uh, and these days where people join our industry, say as a new graduate, even if they haven't used SAS before, they're not able to maybe make that third statement. They can count on the experiences of others uh, around them. But for those of us who are a bit older, um, we probably did learn um, statistics using, using the software. So in this case, I did learn using a bit of SAS. I also learned uh, a bit of Minitab in the day, some S+, a little bit of R. I'm still young enough to have uh, learned R when I was at university. And certainly since leaving uh, formal education, I've had training courses and so on where, I, where I've learned how to implement certain methods using the software. So in this case, um, I think that certainly applies for me. Um, cite citations in statistical literature, well, again, similar to what I was saying about um, SAS, in this case being used throughout industry, um, you will see 
countless um, publications where it's referenced as the, the statistical software that's been used to generate those values. And in addition to publications um, in journals, you also have um, statistical um, books that have been written um, by uh, well-known individuals that, that use the, the software as well. So, and I think that does carry, that carries some weight as well. Moving away from that slightly, the, the last two points I've got on this slide um, don't so much relate to experiences over time, but more what I know about the, the, the owners, in this case, um, SAS, but um, you can apply this to any kind of closed source or, even, or open source software as it will in a second. So I trust that the software only develops using best practices. Uh, again, all of this experience uh, is developed over time. Um, I, I uh, am not speaking here for GSK today, and I cannot tell you whether or not GSK has gone and audited um, SAS, but that's the sort of thing that you, uh, I mean by this statement. Um, for closed source software, um, it might be that you've gone in and you've audited the owner, you've checked their SOPs. Do they have sensible SOPs? Do they follow their SOPs? Uh, and, and that's one way of uh, establishing a level of trust in the, uh, in the owner of the software. Very closely associated that, uh, with that is testing. So um, certainly testing is part of a software development lifecycle um, or SDLC. And uh, it's an indication if, uh, if tests are produced that the, software, um, that the software owner is following good practice. It's also fairly useful uh, in your own installation. So when you're qualifying an installation, um, you will go through a process and you will run tests to make sure that that software operates in the way that you expect in your own infrastructure. So if the software owner provides some tests that you can, uh, you can use, again, that's, a, that's useful in the process of um, building reliable, reliable software and reusing it, uh, because you can verify that it's, uh, it's reusable on various different platforms. So I would loosely break these down into three, three categories. There are many other reasons why you might consider, I'm, I'm sure why you individually might consider software reliable, um, but I would still argue they broadly break down into these three categories. The first, first one there is intuition, which it talks about. The second one I'm gonna call community exposure, uh, or if you like experience over time, how the software has been used by me and by colleagues and by others that I can, I can uh, speak to. And the last one is really about the developer themselves, um, their software development lifecycle or SDLC and, and what practices they, they have followed. So if you indulge me for a little bit more on this, this example is the same example written in R. Um, and at the top, what I've used is uh, dplyr, the dplyr package. Um, and underneath there are functions in base, uh, in the base package and the stats package in R that have been used to calculate those same summary statistics. Quick point of note in this presentation, I don't want to go anywhere near internal packages. So practically in GSK, we would run um, uh, our own pack, we'd load our own package for this and summarize that. Uh, that might be something that Paul touches on um, it, with respect to submissions uh, in a second, because if you're developing your own package, there's, there's um, other processes that you might follow. But let's focus on that top example for a moment. And running it, you can see I've got the same answers as I did um, before, only difference really being the, the rounding and the way this is dis, uh, displayed. Um, so you can see the minimum of one, maximum of five. Standard deviation again, if you remember from the previous example, it was about 1.58. So in addition here, I can actually compare it back to the closed source solution, and that gives me even more confidence. One big note of caution that I'll touch, on, touch upon later is, it's not always appropriate to compare between software. In this case, a standard deviation is a fairly standard calculation, um, and pretty much any so software that's worth its salt um, will calculate it in the same way um, for this, this kind of data. But obviously, more advanced statistical methods are implemented slightly differently in different, so in different software. So the comparison back to a closed source is not necessarily a route that I would, I would always promote. But in this case, it does give me an additional level of confidence. So when I'm asking the question, is it reliable? Again, I've got that intuition. Um, and to run through all of these things again, a little bit quicker this time, I've used the software before. I've already mentioned I've been using it for R for about 15 years, as well as SAS, and I'm very uh, confident in what it does. Um, many others use the so software. R is actually, um, I assume most people know this, but R is actually one of the most popular software languages in the world. There are various programming um, 
indices, so something called the uh, TIOB index, T-I-O-B-E, um, is one that I tend to go to every now and again and look at. And our uh, last time I checked was in the top 10 programming languages, Python. Uh, I don't want to make this just about R and, and most things I, I put up here, you can apply to Python or Julia and other languages as well. Python's are even, even higher up the list normally as a more general purpose language. So you see that it's, it's a popular language, others are using it. Um, and uh, you can see in public forums, you have an advantage with an open source uh, language that um, people will comment and tell you whether the software does what they expect and they'll file bugs, bug reports openly if it doesn't. Again, I learned R um, when I was uh, at university and I checked before this talk and uh, Southampton University um, uh, where I completed my MSc, uh, my master's in statistics, um, still teaches um, survival analysis using R today and, and many other modules as well. I just, check, <laughs> uh, I just checked one or two. Uh, and yet R is a key part of uh, an academic syllabus at, at, uh, at least at the university that I went to. Um, software is uh, used in sites in statistical literature, again, um, with something that's so prevalent across the community, that's certainly true. I've taken out a slide in the interest of time that, that displays a number of different books that um, have been published by renowned authors using R, also uh, particularly in the exploratory space, um, uh, because it's the language, because it's free and it's the language that's used heavily in academia, you'll see a new, a numerous publications um, that use R as the primary language. So that certainly applies as well. And for this next one, um, I trust that the software only develops it using best practice. I just wanted to deviate from that slide for a second and just highlight um, a couple of documents that you um, you might not be aware of. This is very R specific, um, uh, less so for sort of um, other open source languages like, like Python, Julia and so on. But um, in this case of R, the R Foundation have produced this document on the left and R Studio have produced this document on the right. Uh, both are focused around regulatory compliance and validation issues. Um, and you can see the one on the right from R Studio is very, very recent, um, September last year. Um, the R1 has been around for a, a couple of years in its current um, iteration. And essentially that describes things like the software development lifecycle that the R Foundation go through to produce R. Um, it talks about the, uh, the qualifications and relative expertise of the people that write it, their release process, how it's versions, how they respond to bugs and so on. All of that information is in there. If you like, it is almost a virtual audit um, that they have performed on themselves. They've released all the kind of information that you'd want to get if you were to audit a company um, and, and told you about their practices and how it's released. And to verify that, you can actually see uh, much of that in the open source community. Being an open source language and um, uh, releasing in the way they do means you can verify that they do um, release versions at the frequency they claim and, and so on and so forth. Uh, similarly with our studio, um, you can, everything that they, they do is, is on GitHub and you can uh, verify for yourself that they're following the practices they, they claim to follow. So in the case of base, uh, base R and the recommended packages, uh, and in the case of the R Studio Tidyverse for my specific R example, I'm very confident that the software owner develops using best practice and uh, that they provide uh, tests. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of dplyr um, on GitHub. Um, they have a code, high code coverage there um, um, in terms of the number of, um, the number of lines of percentage of the lines of code that are covered by at least one test. And you can see as well here that it's pretty active. Six days ago from when I took the screenshot, um, there, was a, uh, there was an update within, within here. So lots and lots of tests that are available, many of which I can then reuse if I want to verify that the, the language is, uh, that Deeply does what it claims to. So in this particular example for R, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty comfortable in using it. So back to the original question, why is it so difficult to use open source languages for GXP analyses? Um, and I think this is where I would, I call, I'm would i showing you here the R ecosystem. This applies to um, pretty much any open source tool. Um, they'll work in a very similar way. What you tend to have is a base um, or a core product, what I'm calling core R here. Um, that is something known as the base and recommended packages. It's 29, I think by the last time I checked, packages that are you would you get when you go and install r so you go to cram you install r 
you get this base set of packages. That's what's owned and managed by the R Foundation, and it's covered by um, the, it's within scope of that document that I mentioned a couple of slides back. Beyond that, though, there are thousands, I think 15 or 16,000 packages that are called contributor packages. Um, and again, for Python, for Julia, other open source languages, um, whether they call them packages, modules, libraries, these are things that you, the user community contributes. And the problem, if, there, if, if you see it as a problem, is that these have many, many different authors. And so they all follow their own practices. Some of them will follow a formal software development lifecycle, some of them will not. They will have varying levels of popularity. Dplyr is an extremely popular package, um, but for niche statistical analyses, they're gonna have far less exposure to uh, our user community. Um, and therefore the likelihood of uh, any potential bugs goes up. Um, and, and same for de depending on what the package does. It's very easy to verify for graphical packages plotting the points in the right place, much harder to verify if a statistical package is implementing an algorithm, algorithm correctly. Uh, and that really is, is the, the first main challenge. It's not treating R as one big, as one language that we can quote validate um, or decide, determine to be reliable, we can talk, we can certainly talk about that with the base language, but we can't talk about the entire ecosystem in the same terms. And so we have to look at these packages on a case by case basis. Tying that back into my role in the R Validation Hub, um, about this time last year, in fact, January last year, um, uh, Paolo Bargo, John Sims and I um, wrote a white paper on behalf of the R Validation Hub, which covers uh, what we, we describe as our risk-based approach for assessing our package accuracy within a validated infrastructure. And again, we're very clear not to talk about validating, um, validating the language. We talk about a validated infrastructure of which R, Python, any uh, SAS, any kind of language can be part of that infrastructure. And we propose an approach that um, we feel works with, um, works with R in terms of how you would assess um, the the accuracy or the reliability of an R package based on criteria that you can collect by um, scanning the open source um, resources that are available to us. So looking on GitHub, looking at the release notes, looking within the package itself. And that's resulted in a series of tools that we've created. Um, this is a snapshot from a risk assessment applications. This is a Shiny app, which is available from uh, GitHub that you can, you can download. And, it, and, and really, I put this up just to highlight what it is we feel that um, is appropriate in this space. So this is looking at community usage. And you can see here, we selected the, the dplyr package. Um, and we're looking over the last 12 months here. And you can see the release pattern of, that, of the dplyr package. You can see in blue the number of downloads. Um, which is in the millions, and there's a, there's a whole count here in the top right. So that's 16 and a half million downloads in the last year. And this is from the R Studio CRAN, um, uh, CRAN Mirror. Um, equally, you can see the idea of maturity. So Dplyr has been around for 88 months, so it's had a bit of time to embed and for um, various bugs to be fixed. And in some of the other tabs, we'll look at things like the responsiveness to bugs. Um, you know, are, are are the authors, our studio, Hadley Wickham in this case, uh, are they quick to respond to bugs and close them? What's their, you know, what's their bug closure uh, really, um, rate like? And so on. So lots and lots of different metrics, and we're building this up over time as a way of being able to assess the accuracy of a package. So I think now assessing the accuracy of um, or the reliability of open source tools, certainly in the case of R, is, is very much within reach. But there are a couple of other challenges that I just want to highlight um, before I finish. Um, challenge, uh, and this is the, this is the key one really, and that's how do you respond to risk? It's very, uh, and I, I like this picture because it highlights. It's very easy to identify risk. There's a big risk you're going to get hit by a ball if you're in this game. Doing something about it is the is the real challenge. So we can assess packages and we can determine base R and the tidyverse to be very very low risk. We can treat it in the same way I would argue as you treat closed source software. So if you write tests for closed source software, by all means, write some qualification tests for R and the tidyverse as well. If you don't, if you rely on the ones from the author, I don't see why you should do anything different for R or, 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 or potentially Python if you, um, if you assess it in the same way. But if you do identify risk, either because um, you actually think that there is a risk that you know, the, the developer is not following best practices, or perhaps it just hasn't had enough exposure to the community for you to be really sure, 
what do you do next? So um, going back to the ICH, what are what does appropriate mean in this case? How much testing should I do? Does it if I don't trust it fully, does that mean I have to go back to first principles of software validation and write extensive um, requirements and tests against those? Or can I, to some extent, uh, develop a, a hybrid approach? And that's really what the, the R Validation Hub is, is looking at next. And it's not really a question that I found answered. So I think if there's one single answer to the question of why it's so difficult to use open source software, I think it's knowing how to respond to risk. And that's the biggest, the biggest challenge we face. One quick sub point under that, because I'm aware I've only got uh, about a minute left. Um, of this presentation. Um, it is really important in this space to make sure you're comparing apples and apples, oranges and oranges. Um, there is a tendency to um, try and compare R, say, or, or Python to closed source solutions. And I men mentioned earlier, um, there are differences in these languages. There are debates that are going on, raging online about whether type one or type three some squares is, is more appropriate. And so, and the defaults often differ between languages and, and so on. Um, so the important thing is you're asking a, the right statistical question. Is the method that, that R or Python claims to implement, is that method implemented correctly? And it's a different debate about whether that is the right method versus the method that, say, SAS or another language implements. Just comparing two languages, it can add value, but equally it can, be a, a, it can cause difficulties in other spaces. So in summary, my, my last slides, um, so I'm going to go about 30 seconds over. Um, this is the ICH uh, quote again, the key words reliable and appropriate. And I think um, the reliability is definitely something that we can we can measure. And in the cases where it is reliable, I think it's relatively easy to demonstrate why we feel it's reliable and document that as well. The appropriate software testing procedures, I think, is the bit that's the challenge. And, and again, if, if I were to provide an answer to my original question of why it's so difficult to use open source software in a GXP context, I think it's, it's that that is, is the answer. So that's, that's me, thank you. Um, and in the slides, there are a couple of links, uh, acknowledgements to Shutterstock for, for the random photos and our validation and PSI. And there's some links in there as well, that, um, as I'm aware that my slides are free of content. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andy. I mean, that was just a great, uh, introduction and, and, and setting the framework for what the important questions are, the uh, reliability part and, and appropriate being key words. Uh, with that, let's move on uh, to Paul uh, Schutte. Uh, and so Andy, if you can unshare your slides and Paul, you can share yours, I'll introduce you. And, and I'll just, you know, again, thank Andy, but also thank Paul, I mean, having, someone with a regulatory uh, mindset give us their idea of what's going on is just really important to this this whole enterprise and so we really do appreciate him taking the time uh, to talk with us today. Uh, he's the scientific computing coordinator for the Office of Biostatistics in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and a member of the OB Analytics and Informatics staff. Uh, Paul joined the FDA in 2008 after previously working in academia and as a government contractor. Uh, he's the PI for a cooperative research uh, development agreement, uh, CRADA, uh, for detecting data anomalies in clinical trial data, and a member of the FDA's scientific computing board and the high performance computing uh, government advisory board. Uh, he's also on the FDA's modeling and simulation working group and on the interagency R users group. Uh, so with that, uh, Paul, I'm not seeing your slides. It looks like you're... It says we're seeing your screen, but I'm not seeing the it's slides. Say, um, it's paused. Okay. Let's see, let me do, let me try this from scratch and let me share from scratch. Yep. It's not liking it. Let me try one more path. Let's see if I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. And while you're doing that, I'll remind folks, I see a few questions coming in. Certainly, uh, 
big part of meetups is to have some questions. So I can see that if you can just put that in uh, presentation mode, I think you're set to go. And like I okay. said, keep the questions coming. Okay. So um, thank you, Dan, for the kind introduction. And if I can just interrupt you, what we're seeing, what at least what I'm seeing now is more your notes one. So ah, okay. Up hmm. under display settings in the yeah, upper left-hand could... corner there, uh, Paul, there's where it says display settings. Let me get my display settings here. Yep. Yes. And, and there should be a mirror or a duplicate. Duplicate slide window. Yeah, that. that'll work. Um, let's see. My apologies. This worked better when we rehearsed it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but you're good now. If you, I think if you just uh, put that in presentation mode, I think you'll be good. Let's okay. So let's see. A little podium. Yes. Okay. Did that register? Let's see. Yeah, let's give it a minute. There's always a little delay. It's not registering on my end is the problem. Yeah, not here either. So maybe try it one more time. Yeah, um, let's see. If you uh, swap screens rather than mirror, I think you will have what you want. Yeah. So we can try that option as well. Okay. Um, I'm being a little dense here. Um, where would I find swap, swap screens? Here's uh, start from the beginning. Yeah, let's go ahead and start from the beginning again, uh, Paul. So okay. unshare and then share up again. Okay. So let's see. Hmm. Um, can you see my basic title screen? Yes, but okay. it's in your it's in the it's in the slide master. Uh, okay, so let's see. Um, can you try the, the there's a little podium icon in the lower right hand corner. Let's go back to that one. Right in the lower yeah right there click on that. Is that doing anything for you? Um, not it's not that. doing anything for me on my end. Oh, Paul, if you prefer, I can share your slides and you can you can just tell me when to. Uh, that might be better right now. Um, I got a little warning that my connection was unstable. Uh, let's do that. OK. So let's let me do the stop share if you'd be willing to um, advance my slides as desired. OK. Tell okay. Me if you can see them. Yep. Looks okay. Good. So sorry about that. No problem. Um, Take your time. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, this is the standard disclaimer that we have. Um, this presentation reflects the views of the author and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. So if you don't like what I say, blame me, not my agency. Um, Open source, let's start perhaps with a definition. Open source um, has been interpreted from the Oxford Dictionary denoting software for which the original source code is made freely available and may be redistributed and modified. Um, some open source software packages include R, uh, which is, tends to be the one we focus on in this meeting, but it also includes things like Python and the Linux operating system. Um, thank you. Um, the next slide is our statistical software clarifying statement. Um, this is mentioned by Andy. Uh, FDA does not require use of any specific software for statistical analyses, and statistical software is not explicitly discussed in Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, 21 CFR part 11. However, the software 
package or packages used for statistical analyses should be fully documented in the submission, including version and build identification. So how, one of the things we would interpret that is that ideally one would list um, the version of the software as well as all packages and libraries that go into it. Um, even on the closed source proprietary end, one would ideally like to see, um, say for SAS, it's not just SAS 9.4, but which versions of say SAS stat were being used. And we have found that there can be um, minor, but sometimes significant differences between um, various builds, say of SAS software. Next slide, please. Uh, um, as noted in the FDA guidance E9, Statistical Practices for Clinical Trials, the computer software for use for data management and statistical analysis should be reliable and documentation of appropriate software testing procedures should be available. Sponsors are encouraged to consult with FDA review teams and especially with FDA statisticians regarding the choice and suitability of statistical software packages at an early stage in the product development process. If you could hold on this slide for just one moment. So um, there is a link uh, when the slides do go out. What we have, um, there's an interesting story behind this software, um, statistical software clarifying statement. Um, for a number of years, various FDA statisticians had actually uh, opined that it would be perfectly fine that um, R was suitable but we actually found that there was um, considerable pushback on individual opinion. Uh, when I was asked to provide one by um, Tal Galili, the um, person who runs the R blog, we had to explain that it would be better to actually come up with a process. So eight months and three committees later, we have the statistical software statement. Um, so if you wonder how things work, they tend to work fairly slowly, but I think this has uh, hopefully had the necessary um, impetus to allow for some open source development. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, CEDAR submission. So my center is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR, um, which is going to have different processes and procedures than most of the other centers. CEDAR and CBER tend to coordinate things together. So submissions to CEDAR and CBER uh, begun after December 17th, 2016, are required to conform to CEDA standards, uh, primarily those are for the study data tabulation model or SDTM and the analysis data model or ADAM. CDISC stands for the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium and is a standards group that works on clinical trial data. I should add that other FDA centers such as CDRH, CTP, CVM and CIFSAN have different processes and procedures. Um, so they may not always align exactly. Along with the submission standards, there are various other um, standards that come through or other aspects. Um, in addition to just conforming to these standards, there's a study data technical conformance guide that lays out um, technical expectations. There's also an analysis data um, technical conformance guide. And there are therapeutic area user guides or TAUGs. So there's a whole constellation of documentation that goes with this. Um, if we can go to the next slide. 
what may be relevant in this particular um, instance is the study data technical conformance guide has a section on software programs and it states that sponsors should provide the software programs used to create all atom data sets and generate tables and figures associated with primary and secondary efficacy analyses. Furthermore, sponsors should submit software programs used to generate additional information included in essentially the prescribing section. The specific software utilized should be specified in the analysis data reviewers guide or ADRG. Refer to the statement we just looked at for more information. Uh, the main purpose of requesting the submission of these programs is to understand the process by which the variables for respective analyses were created and confirm the analysis algorithms and results. Uh, sponsors should submit software programs in ASCII text format. Executable file extensions should not be used. Um, we do have one piece of regret regarding the statement here. Um, we thought when we drafted this that no one would possibly misunderstand ASCII text format as being .txt. Um, unfortunately, we're finding that um, some folks are interpreting ASCII text format to be a .txt extension, which was never the intention. Both um, SAS program files and R program files are typically in ASCII. So the typical program file should work. We don't want to see any .exes though in the course of our submission, because that will generate a security um, exception. Uh, next page, please. So what are some reasons to use open source software? Um, cost. Um, usually, some people will refer to say open source is free. There, in some sense, there is no free lunch, though. There are indirect costs associated with software, so the savings may not be as great as some might claim. Um, as Andy alluded, um, R is becoming more popular to some extent, Python as well, in our curriculum of our um, recent graduates. So there's a, the folks who are coming into our systems are more familiar with R and Python than say with SAS. Um, innovation, as Andy alluded to, there are thousands of R and Python packages available. Software for journal articles are often in R. And I would say um, increasingly interactive data visualizations and dashboards created with a particular package, Shiny, are common. So there's a great deal of innovation because folks can tap into the entire um, breadth of the data science and statistics community. Whereas the innovation in a um, proprietary package may be restricted just to the employees of the software developer. Um, open source solutions can be shared more readily in some ways. Um, for example, uh, an archive such as CRAN, um, other aspects can be used. Performance. Um, as we start looking into higher performance systems, higher performance computing environments, it can be a lot easier to work with open source tools than to try to navigate the licensing and cost restrictions that are associated with proprietary software packages. Next slide. Um, I've slightly changed the title of this slide to real and perceived challenges. So I'll need to send Dan the updated slide, but um, so these are, I don't wanna, some of these are legitimate challenges. I don't wanna downplay some of this. So um, let's, let's mentally put in the word real and perceived um, for this. Proprietary software is viewed as more stable. Um, 
there's a certain amount of truth to that. We, the downside of having all of that innovation is that there are many more changes to open source software such as R and Python. Legacy code um, has been written using proprietary software. It's another perceived challenge. Um, many companies have thousands of line of code written using software such as SAS or SQL. And in many cases, one doesn't want to um, do away with that. Let's see. And just to confirm, I saw someone said they lost uh, sound. So I guess we were OK. Uh, so I think we can proceed. Um, so there is a sunk cost that obviously is there. And we'll discuss a little bit more. Support. Uh, proprietary software um, may have dedicated technical support. You can be a phone call away from support, whereas in the open source world, it's not quite so easy. Um, that's a definitely a, a one challenge. Validation. Um, open source software are not always perceived to be validated. Um, there's also a perception that open source is more buggy more prone to various bugs. Um, and Andy discussed this at depth. Uh, let's move to the next slide. One challenge that perhaps we don't always think about as statisticians and data scientists is the implementation side. And IT departments may need to have different skill sets to support open source software. Um, so there's definitely a infrastructure support side to consider. Dissemination of results, um, such as making shiny apps to regulators, available to regulators and collaborators, poses logistical issues. Um, we'll discuss that further. And seldom discussed, um, but I have seen this arise is copyright, copyleft, um, intellectual property issues. So um, next slide, please. Um, let me discuss some solutions and possible mitigating factors. Stability. Um, let's be honest and say most open source software does change faster. Um, what we can attempt to do is mitigate some of this, um, things like package management systems, well-written code and programs can mitigate much of this, but there is some level in which there will be um, potential instability if one adopts things naively. So being able to do version control uh, package management, I would say, would be um, crucial. Um, legacy code. So this is the uh, fact that many sponsors have thousands of lines of code in their legacy systems. Well, one way is to not try to reinvent everything, but consider hybrid workflows. Use proprietary software for some purposes, and open source for others. And even now, I think it's relatively common within FDA and within sponsors to say produce an analysis using one software package, but perhaps the graphics using the another. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, support. Uh, technical support may be an issue. Um, I can give you an example where um, I found a bug in an R package written by an NIH statistician. Um, I inf it was an edge case. I informed the person on a Friday and it was fixed over the weekend. On a different note, um, I informed a proprietary software developer of what I perceived to be a bug um, for which there's never been any follow-up. So 
we can't say open source is going to be buggier than proprietary software in my experience. For validation, um, I will defer um, to Andy um, since we just had a presentation on that. Uh, next slide, IT departments. Um, basically, IT departments probably need to change and develop um, continuous integration, continuous deployment solutions, package management, other needs will um, need to be implemented and perhaps change control processes streamlined. Next slide. Uh, dissemination of results. Consider using a package archive such as CRAN as a means of distribution. Um, this works particularly well if one is dealing um, more with open-ended issues. Um, an example that recently came about is GS Design, an R package um, on CRAN developed by statisticians and programmers at Merck was used by Moderna, another company, for um, their COVID-19, for the design of their COVID-19 vaccine trials. Uh, GitHub has also has some potential even with regulatory authorities, but that's a little, that's slightly more problematic. Intellectual property issues. Um, generally, it's not a problem, but you might want to have your legal department look at this. Um, my own work is in the public domain and subject to Freedom of Information Act requests. Next slide. Um, these are some items perhaps for discussion for later. Um, to date, CEDAR has not had a submission that's completely open source from industry. My question is, is this a problem? Um, and there are some ways forward. One is why we consider hybrid workflows. Instead of trying to have everything open source, use proprietary tools for some parts and open source for others. Um, it's been also suggested to look at purely open source solutions. This may require replication of proprietary solutions. Um, and this is a work in progress for some companies. Um, emerging trends. Let's see, I'm probably running a little bit over here. So um, let me get through these. Software as a service. Um, increasingly, proprietary software developers are begun to use cloud platforms to distribute software to users. Um, users would pay access and or usage fees on the cloud platform, as well as software fees. So this has already started to be uh, um, proposed. And I think this is something that's going to be coming down the pike. Next slide. Um, some concerns we have with this software as a service. Will it end up costing more? Can software developers and providers guarantee confidentiality and privacy of queries and use? Um, there's governance issues, potentially. Who does what? There are also some concerns with this in terms of transparency, reproducibility, and intellectual property. And not to be too, just the last part, if we can do the previous slide one moment. Um, there may come a time when only open source can be run locally if this becomes the new model. Next slide. Um, simulations are one of the emerging trends. Um, Cedar and Cber have a complex innovative clinical design pilot program where for the more complex trials, we can't really evaluate the performance characteristics using standard methods. Um, so simulations are the only way and often simulations are going to require um, clusters and or some sort of high performance computing. And that's where in many cases um, we will be looking at open source solutions. Um, Bayesian designs and analyses are also another area. Um, Stan, JAGS, um, and other software packages can be used in combination with R and Python. 
Next slide, please. Um, one other thing that's occurring is larger, messier data sets are being used more widely. Real world evidence, wearable technologies, um, glucose monitoring, for example, is something in the diabetic diabetes world. Um, Fitbits have even been proposed. Genomic analysis, natural language processing, text mining, AI and ML, these are all emerging as um, contributing to the complexity of clinical trials. Um, there may not be a single um, proprietary package that handles this. We'll defer questions and comments till later. And I think that wraps up my presentation. Great. Thank you so much for those insights. And, and we have some questions coming up. But uh, I, I love the way that you laid out a list in, of, of issues and then gave some proposed solutions and, and, and certainly tell us what the emerging trends are. So uh, really appreciate that. And we'll move on uh, to, to our guests from Medtronic. So if, uh, if you guys would share your desktop while I introduce you. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ted Lissig, uh, who's the Global Head of Biostatistics and the Technical Fellow at Medtronic, where he provides leadership and guidance in the use of robust statistical and research design uh, methods throughout the company. Uh, holds the position of Adjunct Assistant Professor at the University of Minnesota, and he's a Fellow of the ASA. Uh, founding Officer and past Chair of Medical Devices and Diagnostics within ASA. Uh, received his BA from St. Olaf's and has degrees from University of Minnesota, University of Washington, and a postdoc at the University uh, uh, in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, prior to Medtronic, held positions of increasing responsibility at AstraZeneca so, and uh, Boehringer Ingelheim, so has lots of pharmaceutical experience. Uh, and he's an internationally recognized industry leader in statistical methodology and a frequent speaker at international uh, statistics conferences. Uh, Tarek uh, Haddad also is coming to us from Medtronic. He's a technical fellow and director of the Machine Learning Statistics Group uh, for R&D at Medtronic. He uh, focuses on the development of machine learning and AI algorithms, uh, which uh, go to improving patient outcomes and efficiencies in patient management. Uh, at Medtronic, he has set the vision for AI and developed uh, talent and hardware and software infrastructure, which allow for the AI and machine learning uh, to take place there. He specializes in deep learning, reinforcement learning, uh, Bayesian modeling, so lots of complicated uh, modeling uh, type methodology. Uh, he has uh, degrees from the University of Minnesota uh, and is a black belt in design for Six Sigma and reliability and manufacturing. So with that, we look forward to their talk. Thank you. Can you can you all hear me? You, you are nice and clear and we can see your slides too. So you're perfect. Great, great. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, having us. Um, so, so today we're gonna be talking a little bit about um, some of the work we did uh, around developing some uh, statistical packages in R uh, specifically for uh, regulatory purposes. And, and we'll give a little background on, on why we did that and uh, some of the lessons learned around uh, this type of activity. Uh, and we, we developed uh, two different packages, which we will go into. Uh, but just to give you a little idea on, on why we developed uh, some new packages really came down to the obvious, which was we needed to develop uh, some new statistical methods that weren't necessarily available in commercial software. Um, so uh, within the medical device uh, industry, there's kind of an increasing cost to doing clinical trials and um, so there was a big push in really trying to leverage some of the pretty advanced uh, modeling work that was being done and to try to be able to leverage that in a way that could possibly uh, help reduce some of the costs and also add some additional evidence around some of the uh, device products. 
And uh, what we noticed was that uh, modeling was becoming a really important part of the regulatory process and the development process, and even in the post-market surveillance process. But there was a, a bit of a gap in the clinical trial uh, phase where the modeling was not being leveraged. And this was a survey that was done in 2014, just looking at how modeling was really ubiquitous across the entire life cycle of a product development, um, but not necessarily in the clinical trials. Um, and this was, you know, obviously, as, as everyone knows, the clinical trial is very expensive. And this was where we thought that, you know, there was a lot of opportunity for um, really innovating in this area. So um, the approach that was developed is really what is called the virtual patient. And it was really trying to add a new slice of the evidence generation of data that could be incorporated into a pivotal clinical trial, or at least some, some phases of clinical trial work um, in a Bayesian uh, methodology uh, setting. So as you, as you heard from Paul, some of the areas that he specifically uh, talked about were Bayesian methods, and that's, that's exactly the area where we were uh, creating packages. Uh, so the idea was to incorporate these virtual patients as priors in a Bayesian uh, clinical trial uh, in order to maintain the clinical endpoints, but with uh, reduced uh, sample size, as well as being able to explore uh, areas of um, areas that aren't necessarily uh, as easy to study in a, uh, in a clinical trial, for example, pediatrics or uh, uh, very frail patients that you, you generally don't want to uh, enroll in clinical studies, yet uh, it's very important to understand how your products will work in those populations. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into the depth of the new uh, statistical methods, um, but one thing that was very apparent at the beginning was as you develop new methodologies, uh, there's you know commensurate uh, amount of coding work, uh, and as we you know really got the voice of the customer from the different statisticians, both from the regulatory side and our own internal statisticians, is that there was a lot of discomfort in many cases around coding up new methods, uh, you know, and so this was an area where we were uh, aware that you know it's not just being able to absorb a new statistical method, but also uh, having a statistician feel comfortable coding it up, uh, presenting it, submitting it in a regulatory setting uh, was a, a real hurdle. Uh, but we did of course have some statisticians that developed the methods that were comfortable doing it, but those weren't necessarily the statisticians that were gonna be always on the clinical studies. So we wanted to develop something that could be used as a, similar to like a SAS proc mixed concept where, you know, you can essentially, you know, call a function. And if there's agreement on that function, then you can keep using that function over and over again without having to have both regulatories, regulatory and other statisticians having to read through, let's say, 50 or 100 lines of code and understand things. Um, so that was the idea uh, behind the first package, which is called the Bayes DP. On top of it, we, you know, we really uh, found that one of the big challenges with adaptive Bayesian trials in general was simply the uh, just sheer volume of code in order to run simulations to get operating characteristics. So that was another uh, important area that we really wanted to come out with an approach that would allow everyone to look at code and understand exactly what was happening. And uh, as Andy mentioned, you know, dplyr <clears throat> is a very useful way of describing in R, describing sort of steps and procedures in a, in code that are understandable. And so that the Bay, uh, the Bay CT package is really designed to do that, really create the same simulations that we create from custom code, but it put it into a format that's easy for everyone involved to follow along with what the simulation was trying to achieve. And, and, and the steps to do it. 
Um, <clears throat> finally, in Bayesian trials in general, and particularly in some of these trials where you have uh, more advanced methods going on, these simulations can take a, a, a really long time. And there was some discussion around uh, previously from Paul around if you're using SAS, there's licensing issues, and if you're going to do uh, you know, parallel computing processes to speed up your code, uh, that can be challenging if you're using commercial software. And so we were really trying to move away from the idea of simulations and operating characteristics that take days and weeks to really getting down to hours and in fact minutes. So we thought that that would really change the way that cl uh, Bayesian clinical trials were done if you were able to combine you know, very easy understandability of the code uh, and really, really efficient speeds uh, for getting operating characteristics, we would get over a lot of the hurdles that adaptive Bayesian trials generally generally have. Um, <clears throat> and, and there's other sort of more <laughs> altruistic concepts around, you know, of course, we're, we were Medtronics, so we were big and we had a lot of statisticians, but it was also something where we thought, you know, other smaller, uh, smaller companies you know, may want to do these type of trials as well and might not have nearly the swath of statistical support. And so having these packages available uh, could allow these type of methods to be used at uh, smaller, uh, smaller companies without the resources. So how did we go about developing the packages? Well, once again, we were very interested in fast implementation. So there was a lot of work uh, around making sure we were doing it in a way that was very efficient. Uh, and so we use a lot of efficient methods um, that, were, uh, that were implemented. Um, and we really wanted to make sure that it followed standard input output uh, characteristics of other R packages. If you think about the uh, LM package or the linear regression package, it's, uh, it's very standard. And so we tried to make all of the applications of the Bayes uh, DP package follow those same exact formulations so people could really understand it. And in the uh, Bayes CT package, similarly, we tried to follow the dplyr approach. Um, and, and, and it was really uh, uh, very, very, quite a lot of work to make sure the packages kind of met the R uh, package requirement. There was a lot of debugging and uh, really going, going through that, uh, that process, which was a real learning experience for the team. And, you know, I would, I would say that one of the biggest areas around packages is not actually the coding, but the documentation, right? So if you're thinking about a package from a regulatory perspective, you have to have a lot of documentation around the package and what it's doing and, and give everybody involved the comfort that they need to know that uh, what is the method that's happening under the hood. And so that's really an R, the vignettes. And so there was, if there was, let's say 20% of the time was done actually coding things and the, the rest of the 80% uh, was spent with uh, documentation. And that's an important uh, thing for everybody to know uh, on, on the call is that documentation is, is, is really important. And that documentation of course came in vignettes, but then there was the credibility of the method uh, as well, which came from publication conferences. We had uh, regulatory workshops um, and we also did uh, some validation. So we, the Medtronic actually hired an external vendor to recode up the entire, uh, the entire package uh, to get a validation result that met the same, that met the requirements. So, you know, with all of that in hand, uh, that, that's really how we went about uh, validating the, the series of packages. I should say that the Bayes DP was really going through this process. Uh, Bayes, uh, Bayes CT or the Bayesian trial that was, that's uh, still a kind of a work in progress uh, that, we're, that we're working through. Um, I think it is important to talk about the considerations. This was not all, uh, this was not all easy and, and fun. And I think it's really important when you think about package development, that if you're a, not a software company, your primary goal is not software development, or at least for an R package. 
Uh, so Medtronic makes uh, medical devices. We don't make statistical software. And I think, uh, you know, at the beginning, everything seems great. You create this package and you're, you know, you're thinking about, you know, you're, you're, you're really focused on it. But then, you know, five years down the road, you have to still maintain that package if you want to continue to use it. And so there's uh, definitely a, a difference between the package owner versus the package developer. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's a very important thing to think about as, as anyone's trying to do this work. Um, and you have to maintain these packages. And so you have to, you know, create resources for that or hand the package off to somebody who can do that on a continuous basis. And of course, there are errors. Uh, there are implementation errors. And uh, we certainly experienced some of these uh, situations uh, where we uh, were running clinical trials or designing clinical trials and certain uh, people on the advisory committee would say at the beginning, hey, could you modify the statistical analysis? And, and because there was an understanding that we had developed the package ourselves, it seemed, well, of course, we can update those packages on the fly and that can cause uh, some issues. Uh, we had some issues with uh, pre-processing the data and sort of you had to know that you had to center the data before you put it into the tool, before you put it into the function, but was that well uh, documented well enough? And uh, as a result, we did have to do some modifications to protocol um, in the middle of things to make it clear that you had to pre-process data before it was loaded into uh, the package. So there were definitely some learning lessons around uh, developing de developing packages. So with that, I will hand it over to Ted. Great, thanks Tark, really appreciate that presentation. If you wanna go ahead and stop sharing, then I'll go ahead and share mine. Okay. There we go, all right. Um, so I'm just going to compliment what Tark was talking about. You know, he was bringing up some great points of things that we ran into for a particular application for you know, um, how we would develop and deploy these solutions for a, a set of trials uh, to support certain key products. What I want to talk a bit more is sort of um, some considerations when you're thinking about this of use for open source as something you want to do across an entire company. So I think this could be relevant for quite a lot of the audience out there. So if I go into here, there we go. All right, um, so you can think of a sequence of questions you might consider when moving to open source. Why would we change? Can we change? There's you know, information from the R Foundation, from the FDA, and how would we change? I'll have a brief conclusion here. Um, and it, I found this rather interesting seeing the actual slides from both Andy and Paul. And that you know, we, we'd had some prior discussions as a group about what we were going to cover in the presentation, but we hadn't shared the actual slides. And now I see quite, quite a lot of similarities. And I think that's a good thing, you know, that we, we share concerns and observations about this whole process. So two major impetus uh, points for why one might change would be one, training efficient inefficiencies. You know, we have seen that recent graduates have much more exposure to an experience with open source solutions, such as R, than with proprietary solutions, such as maybe Stata or SAS, what have you. Um, and then training new employees on the legacy systems, that can be wasteful if those legacy systems are soon to be retired or replaced. You know, how much do you want to spend on getting someone up to speed on something you're not going to continue with? So especially if you're thinking about making a shift, what do you do for persons coming in until that shift happens? Another big aspect is the cost considerations, which is certainly tied into the training inefficiencies mentioned above. You know, it's hard to justify the cost of proprietary software when open source solutions with comparable functionality are, are readily available. Um, you know, one thing that, that bothered me quite a bit was that excess reliance upon a single solution put us in a poor negotiating position when it came time to renew our contracts. You know, because we knew it's like, well, the, the vendor could say, well, you know, here's the price and it's quadruple what you're paying. And for some of those things, it might be like, wow, that sucks, but we're still going to pay it. And I don't like being in that position. And we need to have a viable alternative so that if the lights go out, you could do something different. Um, you know, and for us, like part of this conversation had to deal with, uh, with SaaS in particular. It's not the only uh, proprietary software uh, that we use, but it's a, it's a major consideration. 
And uh, when we were first having these discussions internally about moving towards open source, at that time, our existing contract was such that it scaled roughly linearly, at least supported it, with the number of desktop installations, um, right? So that was something where if we could get people on a one-by-one -one basis off of that desktop into something else, there could potentially be cost savings. And this is at a time when the use of the server or cloud solutions was not widespread. But you know, even if you are interested in changing, then it comes up, well, can you change? And as was discussed previously, and I'm just gonna go through this fairly quickly since it's covered multiple times, you know, the most frequent topic that comes up is around compliance. People like to talk about the 21 CFR Code of Federal Relations, part 11, but you know, that focuses primarily on electronic records and electronic signatures. It doesn't have a lot to say about statistical software. This is something that's been raised many times. And as Andy has gone through in particular, there's a lot of resources been put together. So you, know, you can go to rproject.org to pull out this information on the certification. Um, you know, there's that document that he mentioned, regulatory compliance. Uh, and I, I do like that they both stress well within the document as well as in Andy's presentations, that it's not, you know, it's much more about the entire environment you put around your system and not solely around um, the statistical software for it, uh, per se. It's, it's more than, than just a verification. I think that there's perhaps in some cases too much focus on consistency. Like, can you do this the same thing multiple times and not enough focus on correctness? Uh, which is something that you sort of need to think about more broadly when you do have questions about validation. But again, Andy covered this really well, and I'll defer to his slides for more of this. Uh, looks slightly cut off the screen. Can they be made slightly smaller to fit? Hmm. Um, I'm showing full screen. All right, look we'll at others. I'll keep going. We will also make the slides available afterwards so then you can see them directly. Um, you know, certainly there's that the statistical software clarifying statement, um, which can be very helpful. Um, you know, the FDA clearly stating it's not the case. Um, and then one thing I'll just point out that, you know, for us having this software statement available from the FDA, pointing to the FDA documents, this actually answered the question internally about whether or not we could use R for a validated installation. Um, and I would not characterize SAS this way directly, but, you know, someone in my management chain, you know, when I was presenting this as an option was saying, you know, thanks again, looks like we have a green light, it's time under the 21st century, get rid of the Model T. And I'm just highlighting this again as the point that this material out here about the FDA's view and ours view on the extent that to which R could be suitable for submissions was compelling. You know, that's something that, that was sufficient. So this wasn't our big hurdle. So, okay, um, if we would like to change because of cost and because of training efficiencies, and we believe we can change because it would be a viable solution to use open source, well, how would we do that? Um, you know, one of the things that was happening for us was, and that we're not unique as a company structure, is that the dispersed funding and governance structure that were set up meant that corporate-wide edicts were not viable. We have multiple statistical teams which have leeway on their own to make their own calls. We have a spine team that's been using R and Winbugs for years for FDA submissions, but not everyone does that. So we were set up in more of an encouragement phase as opposed to giving orders. Now, at the same time as this is coming up, we're seeing increasing concerns around privacy and data access in that time frame. Um, and so we came up with this plan that will take the majority of our users from desktop SaaS, encourage them to move to server SaaS, and then moving more towards a server R solution. Right? This is sort of make this less traumatic for people along the way. Uh, it's a plan. The reality, uh, one of the things that came up, you know, remember before I mentioned costs being a major motivator. Well, our new contract negotiations were set up in such a way that there is a flat fee for any SaaS usage, desktop or server, up to a certain number of users. Makes sense from their perspective, right? And you're trying to simplify the licensing. But what that meant for us was that there was no benefit within the life of the contract for not utilizing all available licenses. And since for many persons that are having me cajoled into doing this, um, when cost was a major driver and now is not a major driver, there's less buy-in for that change when they don't see immediate cost benefit. They would have to wait for the, the next round of negotiations. We're you know, running roughly about a, a three-year cycle for our, our contract length. Um, 
The other thing which was somewhat surprising is that we had fairly strong internal resistance, programmers and statisticians from the experienced practitioners. You know, so we pushed to have new hires use the newer tools. Paul talked about this a bit. And we delayed on the movement away from SAS for the tenured colleagues. That way we could maintain the intellectual capital of our expert users. We have people that are very facile with these tools. And there's also the legacy code around. We'd also seen that certain tasks working with device data work very well within SAS. We don't, haven't yet developed competitive alternatives. You know, when I say device data, for those of you that are familiar with working with say Holter monitoring studies, you know, think about the a number of variables that are available in those data sets, you know, of like your tracings for your electrical information for how the heart's beating. You know, we get that sort of data on nearly all of our, our active devices studies for vast amounts of time. And so, you know, this is a very large amount of data for the biomedical industry of the volume we're having to work with. And so we've got good setups for it. And it's not just familiarity, it's also processing time for how the current solutions work. And so if we don't have something that can be processed in a reasonable time with the setup we currently available, well, that's a challenge. The other thing we found that is that if a newer hire needed to perform some of the tasks involving working with device data, then they would end up using SAS. And so it wasn't enough to say, well, if you're new, you're gonna use the new tools. Well, no, if you're new and working on certain projects, they need to use the old tools too. And then keep in mind is that even if you are splitting up, you know, maybe you're using something like SAS or state or SPSS for certain tasks and open source for others, these licenses generally aren't set up based upon hours of work. They're based upon heads that use the software for any period of time during a year. And so as long as someone is using the proprietary source for any bit of time, you're not saving on your licensing costs. So you know, you, you, it's difficult to set this up. Um, we're still proceeding though with our setup of our server solutions, but it's been an uphill battle to get wide voluntary adoption. So just to, to sum up here, the cost in various forms was the biggest driver for us considering a mandated change across the company. And the delayed nature of those cost benefits really reduced the interest in changing away from SaaS and, you know, again, we have other persons using um, state in particular. Uh, the compliance fears, I mean, I saw, uh, I think Michael brought up a couple of different questions about the compliance. Uh, we raised it, we did not see that that was gonna be the major hurdle. We were happy with, uh, with how that would work out. And again, we also have prior experience, granted within CDRH as opposed to CDR and CBER with using our own submissions. So for us, that, that, was not the, that was not the challenge. There was however, a larger issue of ensuring the validation of novel R code in that high profile project, Tarek's discussion, he alluded to. But the biggest challenge to date had been, uh, is that large mature team that is change averse. You, know, you have institutional inertia. Here the inertia is that it's sitting there and doesn't want to move. Though I do suspect that there will be uh, an additional opportunity to change minds with the future rollout of SAS VIA, because if you're you know, in a place where you might want to change how you interact with the code, well, then you could also change and move to some other solution. So I think that will be quite interesting. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention. And just one thing I'm pointing out here is that I'm presenting this as on the part of Medtronic, but I'm actually leaving Medtronic at the end of the month. So if you do have any questions about this, want to follow up with later, please reach me through my personal Hotmail address. And with that, I will hand it back over to our organizers. Great. Thank you so much, Ted. I mean, there's just, it's funny because I just, I did not realize how many different reasons there are for people to want to use open source. I, I think from my own personal uh, point of view, it's always about trying to do things that you can't do easily in SaaS or other software, but but there's the cost and uh, the infrastructure. There's, there, there's a lot of different topics in there. And, and I really appreciate that you uh, that you covered that from from you know your company or your former company's uh, perspective because that's that's an important perspective. So uh, again, thanks to all the uh, the panelists. If, if you guys want to turn your uh, videos on, that would be good as we answer questions. Uh, and I guess I'll ask first, uh, are there any questions that you want to ask each other before we get to the ones that are uh, have been proposed? And uh, if you've proposed questions, you can see some of them have been answered uh, you know, by typed answers, and we'll leave those as B. Uh, and we'll get to at least some of the ones that 
that I think are would be of general interest. But before we get there, any uh, questions or comments among the panelists to each other? Yep, go ahead. So yeah, I got a question for Paul. So Paul, you know, you someone had asked you, right, uh, if there have been any full submissions, and you come counter back and said no. But then you also in your slides talked about how for the Moderna vaccine that they had been using R in part, and I'm presuming this is for the EUA, maybe you're differentiating the EUA yes. from the full submission. So I wonder if perhaps you could comment for, you know, what you are aware of that have been seen in particular at Cedar Cebraside, you know, perhaps for mm -hmm. R used as part of a submission or something like that. Right, so um, I have actually, my very first submission that I worked on, one component was written in R. And that was over 10 years ago. So there's a long history of having some components in R, um, but not necessarily an entire submission. So in this case, the um, design aspect for, I think, the um, Moderna um, COVID-19 EUA emergency use authorization was done using GS design, the GS design package. Um, I don't know if how much they used R overall since it came to a different center than the one I'm in, but just looking at their public um, disclosures, was where I saw that. Um, it's We're starting to see a little bit more hybrid solutions as indicated and our own workflows internally tend to be hybrid ones, which as you were pointing out, doesn't necessarily give us the cost savings that we would have liked because of the way SAS is licensed. Thanks for that Paul. Thank you. So, so let's move on. And, and Paul, there's a lot of questions for you and you've answered some of them, but I'd, I'd like to move to some of the other panelists and, and then maybe come back to you if we have time and, and move, I guess, to Andy next in that, uh, you know, I think this idea of, uh, of risk uh, and, and sort of rating packages and stuff on risk makes a lot of sense. And the, the white paper from, from the R Validation Hub uh, really does a great job of laying that out. I wonder what you think, uh, you know, how, what's the best way to bring the community uh, together so that everyone isn't doing their own risk assessments? And I realize that's a large question, but, it, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, at some level, things can be done together, but at some levels, you have to uh, work on the risk on your own platform. So I'd like to get your comments on that. Let me just, sorry, I was double muted. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a really good question. I think to some extent, it's always down to the individual company to determine what's an appropriate level of risk. We, um, at the R, uh, R and Pharma conference last year, we ran a workshop for the R Validation Hub. And um, I asked a question to the people there about what they did for um, their closed source solutions, uh, or SaaS specifically, uh, what level of testing they did. And it's really interesting that some companies will um, basically just accept the qualification tests that come with SaaS and they'll do nothing on top of it. Other companies will write their own additional sort of scripts and so on just to check that it's, it's all working as they expect. Um, uh, as an additional level of detail on top of that. And that, that's for SaaS, which is obviously well established. So I think in the R space as well, and then generally for open source, that will continue. There'll be companies that feel they have to do a lot more. They have to write a lot of tests and so on. And for a risk assessment in particular that you asked about, I think there will be things that some companies focus on more than, than others. Um, unfortunately, in some ways, because I think it would be nice if it was more standard. What, what we've tried to do with the R Validation Hub is provide tools. So the risk metric R package has a number of different metrics that are in there. I think over time, I think we can get to a point where the actual metrics we collect are going to be fairly standard that people see, and it might just be the weightings that people put on those. And we've already built that into the package for what it's worth. That you can you know if, if number of downloads is somehow more important to you than um, I don't know a number of years in existence for the package, 
uh, you could weight that accordingly. Um, and and we, we started having conversations recently about do those metrics change for statistical packages versus non-statistical packages because number of downloads doesn't really tell you very much about a statistical method, but it can tell you a lot more about um, you know, something like Dplyr that's widely used. Um, it's very easy to verify for any individual, regardless of your statistical training, whether you have filtered your data set correctly, but it's a lot harder to verify whether a mixed model has been implemented correctly. So the measures might be slightly different. The metrics might be slightly different between different types of package. But I think we can get, I think we get to a point where we've got something fairly standard and standard tools available. And then it's just the interpretation of those standard metrics that, that varies perhaps. Great, thank you. And then moving, you know, more to to the device side and, and, and what Medtronic has done. I, I mean, it's really great to hear from you guys because you guys have real experience in trying to implement this. And I'm curious, uh, you know, especially for the, the, the areas uh, that aren't, one can't really do easily in, in other software. Uh, you know what? What really are the the main like uh, you know, points you would make to someone to actually get that going in their in their own company at a pharma company? I mean, you, you you mentioned some of them, but but you know, I guess what pieces of advice would you have for for folks who are trying to do this now, in, 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 with your experience in in the mirror? Well, I would say there is a there is a a big difference between you know just writing a particular you know like a, a a unique set of codes for a very specific application versus trying to develop a package that's going to be used outside for multiple purposes or well maybe not multiple purposes but people outside of your specific uh group right and so i think <clears throat> there's clearly different considerations and so uh with the case study that i talk about we were of course you know looking to have something that was usable by anyone who wants to use it um and so i think those are those have different considerations and there's a lot more to it if, if you're just going to if you've got a very specific calculation you need to do or method and you want to write some custom code I think um, I think the clarity and the simplicity of the code makes a huge difference in how you document it. If if you want regulatory uh, uh, the regulatory agencies to be able to read the code and understand it, I think you have to write the code uh, with really good uh, re really good programming practices uh, so it's it's legible and understandable. Um, both even for you know review from other statisticians within your your department uh with packages that's a whole that's a whole nother realm of uh difficulty that you have to deal with so, so i'm taking your message that if it's for a specific purpose keep it simple is that kind of what you're saying yeah yeah i think you can <laughs> you know that you can you can write a thousand a thousand line code that you know if you really you know, if you document it well and think about it and organize it, I think that can be a lot more digestible than if it's uh, done poorly. And <clears throat> unlike, you know, software engineers, I think some, you know, there are different levels of uh, software practices in the statistical community, right? You have certain statisticians that will write code a certain way, and then other statisticians that will uh, write code in a, in a more you know, sophisticated way. And I think, I think I'm trying to be polite, sophisticated, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, I think, uh, you know, I see Paul really nodding, like he's seen some pretty horrendous code probably. <laughs> okay, great. And, and I guess, I mean, this goes a little more to, to you, Ted, I guess, but you know, where are you now? And where are you now in terms of adoption? I mean, you mentioned that really in your uh, your interactions with the regulatory folks, it doesn't sound like you've gotten a lot of pushback on using open source. Uh, and I'm just curious, uh, first of all, am I interpreting that right? And second, uh, you know, what you're feeling about that is, is, is that, does that sort of validate the way you guys are going 
or you know, do you still have questions about that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go back and again, um, so for those of you that are aware, so that, like, there exists a guidance document that CDRH put out on the use of Bayesian design some years ago, right? So this thing came out and uh, it's gotta be like at least eight years old or more. Um, but like, it was an interesting document because there, there were years like on the order of four or five between when the draft document came out when it was finalized, right? So it, it, th there's a lot of discussion and ways to deal with it. But the reason I'm bringing it up is some of the key examples that were used in that document were actually studies that we ran at Medtronic. So from our spinal division. So, you know, we can make a decent argument that we were the, you know, the first major company on the CDRH side to have major submissions being run uh, using Bayes. And at that time, you know, a lot of it was with R and Win bugs to get our submissions in. You know, and so that it was the case that we had particular analyses that we wanted to run, and the efficient way to do that was with using open source tools. And you know, we did not have major problems just from the choice of open source for doing that. Right, that was fine. However, you know, part of the reason why we were successful at those times is the designs we were using were relatively simple. I mean, you can think in general about a, a lot of Bayesian approaches can be broken down into two major approaches. You're either doing within trial learning or between trial learning. Right, and so the between trial learning tends to be hard, especially when you want to pull in an informative prior. Well, how informative is it? Where are you getting it from? What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're doing within trial learning, you know you've got a flat uninformative prior, and like we would use this for example to predict, say, five-year outcomes from one-year measurements. You know, when you've got a really long staggered enroll, right? And so what happened for those early patients? What was the relationship between the early measurement and the later measurement? Right, so it's within trial, um, but it's a real simple model. It's not super complex. And so that's the sort of thing where someone can look at the code and be like, oh yeah, I follow that, that makes sense. Um, and so we didn't have the challenges. Tarek's bringing up the appropriate point that you know another attraction for going with open source is you're trying to do something that is not yet readily available in the commercial packages, right? Commercial packages take, in some cases, you know, a longer time to get that totally you know, buttoned up solution. And so you run a little bit of this risk. It's like, you can get to it sooner but do you have full alignment and documentation about all the steps that are needed to get there? And so I would say, yes, we are still supportive of going down the open source route. We see that as a solution, but we're also more aware that, you know, prep time, right? Right tool for right job. You know, if, if this is something, sometimes you're, you're more interested in saving uh, patients. Sometimes it's more interested in saving dollars. Sometimes it's more interested in saving time. Right, and sometimes if you're going down these routes where you're doing something for the first time, you're you're sort of um, you're taking extra time to do that, right? And do you have the, the bandwidth to do it? So it's a consideration, but at least it's a viable option for us to consider at this point. Great, thank you. And and we're pretty much out of time, so I'm going to put up the last slide. But while I'm doing that, I'd like to get one more question into you, Paul. And and this came in in the question and answer about how easy is it for the folks like the FDA to reproduce the environments uh, like in our environment. But I kind of want to ask the bigger question, which is, you know, what is the biggest pain point for you guys? And, and, and you know, is it something that sponsors and folks submitting to you can, can somehow address? If, if there's sort of one thing on the wish list that, uh, that sponsors and so forth could, could address and make your guys' life easier in dealing with open source software, what would that be? And, while you're answering that, I'm going to share my last slide here. Um, I'd say document your methods. Document, document, document. Um, we see code that sometimes looks pretty embarrassing, um, including f code written by our internal folks. That's not to pick on industry. But to document your sources, document how you do things, um, make it as clear as possible. Um, also, simplify to, if you can. We're interested primarily in getting results that we can verify. Um, it doesn't have to be in the prettiest format. Thank you. So. Let me again uh, thank our speakers. Uh, this has been extremely informative to me. I, I hope it's been just in, informative uh, to our participants. Uh, this is clearly a very important topic. And, and so 
I'm really glad that we had uh, some excellent presentations and, and a good discussion of it. Uh, I'll remind folks that a recording uh, of the beat up and slides will be posted. Uh, it usually takes a few days to get them up there uh, at the NIST website. And I, I certainly have to thank uh, the NIST folks, uh, Glenn Johnson and, and Jim Rosenberger for being the technical experts on the Zoom. Uh, our speakers, you know, volunteered their time. So, uh, you know, I used to tell people that when you see them at conferences, buy them a cup of coffee or say hello. Uh, we're not going live to uh, conferences at the moment, but certainly if you get a chance, uh, thank them offline because uh, they do it all just out of the goodness of their heart and, and for the goodness of, of the profession. So uh, again, uh, thank you, Paul, uh, Tarek, uh, Ted, and Andy, and, and Andy especially too, coming to us late from across the, uh, uh, the ocean. So with that, uh, we'll close this version of the uh, NIST Merck Meetup. Uh, we'll look forward to the next one probably in the fall sometime. Uh, if you have any suggestions for topics for that, uh, be sure to put them uh, in the questionnaire that you'll get at the end of this or, or send an email to me. And with that, uh, we'll close the meetup and thank everyone again.